Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Uh, why don't you stand as I'm going to read from Psalm 111, verses 2 to 4. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And I think that's the perfect verse to lead into our first song this morning, um, How Great Thou Art. So let's join and sing together.
pray together this morning. Our Father in heaven, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you are the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. Praise the Lord. We give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole hearts in this congregation. Great are your works, Lord God, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendour and majesty are your works, and your righteousness endures forever. You have caused your wondrous works to be remembered. You, O Lord, are gracious and merciful. You provide food for those who fear you. You remember your covenant forever. You have shown your people the power of your works. The works of your hands are faithful and just. All your precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. Father, we have not been faithful or just. We have failed to honour you as God and have sinned against you in word, thought and deed. But we praise you, Heavenly Father, that while we were still sinners, you through your Son, Jesus Christ, have sent redemption to your people. You have commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Help us to be those who practice it and have a good understanding. Father, your praise endures forever. Amen. Amen, church. It's good to see you. Uh, As you take your seats, let me welcome you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zach. If I haven't met you yet, I hope to do so soon. Uh, And I get the privilege of being a student minister here at City on a Hill uh, in Brisbane. Uh, You know, we've had an encouraging uh, past couple of weeks. Last weekend was Easter. Uh, We got to celebrate uh, Good Friday together, coming together across those two services uh, to celebrate and remember uh, the death of Jesus on the cross in our place. And then on Saturday morning, we celebrated with uh, three baptizees, which was a great time together. Uh, And then Sunday morning, across our three services, we had uh, Resurrection Sunday, which was an incredible time of remembering and celebrating that uh, Uh, Jesus not only died in our place, but he also uh, rose powerfully to life, um, proving that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, uh, even over death and sin, uh, which is great news for you and I. Uh, And the next major event in the life and ministry of Jesus is his ascension to the right hand of the Father in glory. Uh, The Apostles' Creed clearly states that he, Jesus, ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. You know, in a world of chaos and confusion and frustration and upheaval, um, a lot of uncertainties around the world right now, maybe even uh, in your own very life, um, it is assuring and it is a great hope to know that Jesus Christ, our Saviour, is also sitting at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, interceding on our behalf, praying for you and I. Romans 8.34 says this, Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. And this is the Jesus that we desire to know and make known here at City on a Hill. Um, And to that end, we're going to continue to participate together this morning in singing uh, songs about who Jesus is. We're going to pray more to him. We're going to uh, hear God speak to us through his word. And then a bit later, Pastor Mike's going to come and uh, preach to us as well, uh, which will be a great time together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Cool. Uh, If you are new with us this morning, we're so glad that you are here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, If you parked down in the basement, that was the best choice because we can validate your parking ticket for up to three hours free, which means you don't have to run off after the service, but you can stick around, um, have a coffee or lunch, a tiger eye, or um, yeah, maybe head out somewhere else with some people. Uh, So if you want to get that ticket validated, go and see our welcome team, which are out in the foyer. Um, And they would really love to connect with you. If it is your first time, or maybe you've been coming for a bit, but you haven't really connected in with our church, uh, you can do that by going out there and um, 
they will uh, help you get connected in. They'll take some details and uh, yeah, let you know what's going on in the life of our church. Also, if you're joining us online this morning, we are so glad that you are here uh, and that we have yeah, the technology to make this available. Hey, um, got a few announcements for your calendars. Uh, we have our first City Women Morning, uh, which is on this Wednesday morning, the 27th of April. It's going to start at 10 a.m. And we're back at the house, uh, which is in East Brisbane. Uh, the theme for this year is Living for Eternity. Uh, and there's going to be uh, good Bible teaching, music, encouragement, and of course, coffee. Uh, plus, there's a creche provided for little kids. So, uh, best option there is to RSVP. You get the address details, but also if you are wanting to put any little kids into creche, it helps us to know the numbers that we need to be looking at there. Uh, Gospel Community Greenhouse is coming up. It's going to be across two Mondays, the 2nd and the 9th of May, uh, and both those nights will be at 7 p.m. Uh, it's going to be a good time together of sort of learning why we do small groups, which we call gospel communities, why we gather together in these groups midweek. Um, so it's a good chance to uh, be a part of that. It'll feel a bit like what a gospel community looks like. Um, we'll get to learn how they run and uh, why they're so important. Plus, if you're not in one yet, uh, we might be able to plug you into one uh, in a relevant suburb or uh, yeah, oftentimes after these greenhouses, brand new ones start, uh, which is really encouraging. So uh, there's plenty of room and opportunity to be a part of a gospel community in our church. Dinner's included for that one. <clears throat> Sorry, so uh, even if you just register for the free dinner, that's always a win. Uh, introducing Jesus. We kicked off last Tuesday night. It was a good time together um, and we are going into week two uh, this coming Tuesday night. We're going to be meeting 7pm at the Bavarian, uh, the one just down past Coles down here, 7pm. Uh, and we're looking at uh, what's wrong with the world and the problem of suffering. So a really relevant topic um, and one that is uh, yeah, really encouraging to look at together. Um, and also, dinner's included in that one. See if you can pick up the themes here. If you just register for a bunch of events, you might not have to buy dinner for a whole like month. So it's worth your while. Uh, but if you want to do any of the registrations for that, if you want to find out more about our newsletter or social media, anything like that, catch up on old sermons, head to koa.co forward slash briz um, and you'll be able to find all the relevant information there. Uh, our church is 100% dependent on the generous sacrificial giving of this church. Um, so we're so thankful to those who are already financially partnering with us. Um, and if you aren't yet doing that, can I ask you to prayerfully consider what that might look like for you? If you are calling this church home, how can you be involved financially to help fuel the mission of the gospel in Brisbane through this church? Hey, as I mentioned um, a moment ago, we got to celebrate baptisms with a bunch of people last Saturday morning, uh, and that happened right across our movement. So uh, we're just going to fix our eyes to the screen and watch a quick little recap video.
purchased me with his own blood. And I stand in his righteousness, washed by his mercy and love. So yeah, as it looks, it was an incredible weekend right across our entire movement. Um, can I encourage you, if that uh, piqued your interest, if there are any questions you have, uh, what even is baptism, anything like that, can I encourage you to come and talk to one of our leaders? We'd love to uh, chat to you more about that um, and yeah, point you in the right direction. Hey, um, we're uh, close to jumping into our text for this morning, but before we do that, why don't we just take a couple of minutes, turn around, say hello to each other, and then we'll come back and read God's Word together. Well, we look forward to uh, those conversations happening uh, afterwards, continuing on in the foyer, uh, or maybe a coffee, or maybe a lunch a bit later on. Uh, can I encourage you, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you open them up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be reading the first 11 verses together. Uh, Pastor Mike's going to come in just a moment and um, explain and proclaim this text to us, um, a classic gospel text. Uh, and then next week, we are kicking off our Rebuild series uh, with Ezra and Nehemiah. So uh, stay tuned for a bit more info about that. But for now, uh, can I focus your attention to God's Word? Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I have persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Zach, and good morning. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at City on a Hill. Uh, so glad that you could join us this morning, and special warm welcome. Uh, if I have not uh, had the privilege of meeting you yet, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray and ask God for his help uh, for me, uh, for us, as we engage with his word, as he speaks to us uh, through his word. So why don't you join with me as we pray? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we even have the privilege of talking to you as the God of the universe. And thank you that you're not silent, you're not aloof, but you have spoken to us. You've spoken to us through your Son and you've spoken to us through your Word. Thank you that your Word is living and active and that it changes lives. And I pray uh, that this good news that we hear about this morning uh, would be a reminder and encouragement and life-changing news. Uh, Father, I pray for me, may I be clear, faithful and helpful. Um, and I pray for us, would uh, our, our ears and hearts be changed by your word through your spirit. Lord, we also thank you for those who have sacrificed their lives for freedom and peace. Um, and we want to honor them and remember them. Uh, but Lord, even more, we thank you for your son who was sacrificed so that we can have eternal peace. And in his name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder what the last bit of life-changing good news you heard. Uh, maybe it was graduation. Uh, maybe it was getting a job promotion. Maybe kind of cracking it into the, the Brisbane property market. Well done, especially if you bought kind of three years ago. Uh, maybe it was you know, getting engaged. I met someone this morning, got engaged. They told me the good news of that this morning. Uh, for me, I remember the last, oh, well, a big piece of life-changing news happened to me four years ago. My wife, Sarah, told me that she was pregnant. Uh, the awkward thing was, though, we were actually in different states at the time. Uh, so I was, I was on the Gold Coast. Um, I'd just been helping out for a church. And um, she was in New South Wales, uh, kind of seeing some family. And um, I, I, was, I was helping out with this church. And the kind of idea was that you could sort of get billeted out, um, this host family, and then you go and have lunch with them after church afterwards. Except the thing was, this family uh, that I was meant to have lunch with, they'd nicked off to Movie World. And didn't tell me. <laughs> didn't invite me. So I was just kind of by myself. I didn't have a car because I got a lift in. And I was just kind of awkwardly just trying to connect with people. They were about to lock the church. I was like, oh, can I have lunch with you? I invited myself around to this random family's house. Had lunch with them. Um, and, and as I was doing that, um, you know, they're doing the kind of get to know you questions and stuff. I get this text. And it's a text of a picture of this little device with two lines down it. No context from Sarah. I'm like, what, what is this? I think it's 2018, so this can't be like a, a positive rat test. Um, what? I get this phone call, and Sarah tells me, You're, we're pregnant. I'm like, what? It's a ma-. So I'm kind of sneaking off, like, um, you know, around the corner. She's like, I need to go. I'm like, cool. I sit back down, you know, I'm um, meeting these people. And honestly, I couldn't tell you their names today. <laughs> um, and they ask me, you know, I get to know your question. Oh, so do you have any kids? What do I do? How do I answer that? I just blurred out. I found out two minutes ago that my wife's pregnant. We're expecting a baby. It was crazy. Like I hadn't told anyone else. I hadn't told like family. Like I hadn't even seen her, my wife. And I just told this random family this good news. It's good news. It changes us. This was life-changing news for me. It changed my identity. I was now a father. I'm now responsible for, now we've got two, two little girls, two human beings. I have fundamentally have been changed who I am. Something about good news. It, 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 we can't help but want to share it. That news four years ago, I just blurted it out because it was good news. The passage we're looking at this morning, we're going to see some good news. We're going to see some better news. And I want to, I want to challenge us and say, that if this news isn't the best news that we've ever heard, then we probably haven't understood it. If this isn't the best news that we've ever heard, then we probably have not understood it. So we're looking at good news that changes us far more than becoming a parent or a business owner or a graduate or a manager or a husband or a wife. It changes our reality, not just who we are now, but where we'll be forever in the future. The part of the Bible that we're looking at this morning, uh, in the letter of 1 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, he's writing to a church that's full of mess. Uh, they, they were boasting about their spirituality. They were kind of arguing about kind of which preacher they preferred. Um, they were fighting, um, you know, getting drunk during the Lord's Supper, during communion. Uh, they were taking each other to court. 
There was one bloke who was even bragging about sleeping with his dad's wife. Like this church was messy and broken. And Paul, he kind of hammers um, them for all the dumb stuff they're doing. But in chapter 15, it's really the climax of the whole letter. Um, keep it open if you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one see the guys at the info desk afterwards. Um, but he hammers them not for their actions, but for their beliefs. Uh, if you look down in verse 12, uh, you can see that some were saying that there is no resurrection, that they believe that this life here and now was it. Uh, Paul would later say that if there's no resurrection, then Christians are, are lame, they'd be pitied, they're, they're, they're looked down on more than others. Um, and now this, this thinking that there's no afterlife, it's pretty pervasive in our culture today. A lot of Australians think that way. And to be honest, I often kind of functionally think that way, that, you know, that this life, kind of, you know, from womb to tomb, that, that's it. It's sort of game over after that. And so I need to do what I can now to, to enjoy myself, to, to live it up, to, to make the most of opportunities, to enjoy things and to have experiences, give myself comfort and enough me time. But Paul rebukes that way of thinking for the Corinthians and for us this morning. And he shows us what is truly important. So check out with me verse 1. Paul says, Now I, want to, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you have taken your stand. He reminds them of the good news. See, this has already been shared uh, with the Corinthian church. This isn't the first time that he's sharing. See, they've already received it. You know, many of the church had already become followers, had already professed faith in Jesus, you know, saying, Yes, I'm signing up for this news. Yes, I am a Christian. But even though uh, they'd heard it before, they'd received it, there was a danger that and there's a warning for them and for us to check out verse 2. This is the gospel, which literally means good news, by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. There's a danger for us that if we don't get this right, we've believed in vain. We're just fake Christians, that we aren't really saved. So here's my first point. Uh, if you're taking notes, head to those on live stream as well. Um, first point, the essence of the gospel. Three points. I'll start with E. If you were to ask you know, what Christianity was all about, how would you answer that? How would you answer that? You know, what do you believe? Like, What is it that you believe? Do you really believe that? What, what is it? How would you summarize that if you had... you know? 30 seconds in an elevator with someone. You know, not that we talk in elevators, but how would you, how would you describe that? You know, that question, I often like, like to flip that round on people uh, when I have chats about God with people and ask them, hey, what do you understand to be the basic message of Christianity? And it's quite fascinating, quite insightful what people say because often people who aren't Christians who answer that, often what they're describing is not Christianity, but kind of goodianity, kind of this, this version of kind of moralism that if you're kind of good enough, God will accept you, which is not the message of the Bible. But look, let's see, what is it? What is Paul's um, hope here? What is the essence of the gospel? We'll check out verse 3. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. See, he's received this himself. Who's he received it from? From Jesus. He's received Jesus' message with Jesus' authority to pass on, to deliver to Jesus' church. And he's been given authority to do that, and it's of first importance. And so, verse 3, we need to kind of underline this. If you've got a pen in your bag, you know, underline it. If you've got a Bible app, highlight it, um, all caps, you know, bold, underline. This is important. Christ died, verse 3, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. If you want a one-verse summary of the Bible, that, that's a great one that Christ died according to the Scriptures. This is the essence of the Gospel. In fact, um, this sentence, this verse, uh, it was actually a creed. Um, it was something that Christians had been, um, even for years before this, this was probably written in about the 50s AD, even for years before this, perhaps even for just a few years after Jesus' death and resurrection, that Christians were just reminding each other of, of what is the Gospel. Uh, the entire message of the, of the Bible can be summarized, really, <laughs> in these few words. Let's break it down because they are important. Firstly, Christ died. Christ died. The, the first part of the good news, ironically, is death about a man dying. Jesus, God's only son, came into the world not primarily to make it a better place, 
though he did, not primarily to teach values, though he did. He came into the world to die. Paul, he reinforces this in verse 4. He was buried. You know, Jesus, as a real human, died a death in a real tomb in Jerusalem. You know, Dave was talking about this last week. You, know, you can go to Jerusalem and there's kind of 20 tombs of Jesus that you know, people all claim is the real one. We're not sure it's the real one, but they all have the same thing in common, that Jesus' bones is not there. He was, he was buried in a tomb. He died a physical death. What second part of the gospel, why? For our sins. See, Jesus didn't just die and um, set an example on how to love, um, on sacrifice, though that's important. Um, he didn't show us what it means to face injustice or to leave a legacy. These things are true. They missed the main point. Why did he die? For our sins. What does sin mean? Sin isn't kind of naughty things. Uh, sin is ignoring our creator. See, God's perfect. Uh, his standards are, are perfect. He's pure. He's holy. Unlike you and I, he's got perfect standards. He's not going to just let me kind of rock up to him in his presence with even just a little bit of my lust or laziness um, or selfishness, my arrogance. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we're far more sinful than we can ever imagine. And how often do you kind of fail to even meet your own standards, let alone the perfect God of the universe? Imagine for a moment uh, that everything you ever did, everything you ever said, everything you ever thought, every kind of thing you ever searched on the internet, every website you've been to, even your bank statements, the motivations behind even the good things you've done. Imagine if we could somehow kind of download that, chuck it in the computer, play it up on the big screen in Cinema One at 11.30. Hands up if you'd stick around for that, the movie of your life. Hands up if you'd invite people in to come and see everything that I have ever done. No hands. It's confronting. It's confronting. There's some things that, that we don't even like rec recounting ourselves, let alone bearing before others. God knows all the dirt, all the, the, the filth in our life. He, he, it's gross to him. It's disgusting. He says, it, it offends me. You've given me the finger like this is awful. What you have done. I've loved you. I've made you. I've given you life. And yet this is what you've done. And yet, what does God say? He says, I love you. I forgive you. Because of Jesus, I'm not going to hold that against you. I've given my son to be in your place so that you can be right with me. You can be friends with me. You are free. Jesus died on the cross for you. You can call God father and friend. Next part, Christ died, according to sin, um, Christ died according to the Scriptures. According to the Scriptures. Now, this is an incredible little phrase. Uh, what Paul is saying, that the Word of God, it testifies to this message. The Bible, it testifies to this message. Now, this letter, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, written maybe in the, probably in the 50s um, AD, uh, maybe 20 years or so after Jesus' death. Now, when Paul says, according to the Scriptures... What is not, he's not saying according to the, the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they haven't been written yet. So what's Paul talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. That, that's Jesus' Bible. He's talking about all the events kind of written the first two-thirds of your Bible. According to the whole Old Testament, actually points towards this message. Uh, if you've got a Bible, uh, open it up about halfway through to Isaiah, uh, one of the prophets, chapter 53. Open it up to Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Isaiah is a prophet. He's writing about 700 years before Jesus. And among other things, he's predicting the future. Uh, now, listen to who he's describing. Tell me who you think he is talking about. Who's this man? Who's the subject of this paragraph? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, which just means sin. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. You know, whenever I, I read that passage to kids at kind of kids' church or RI, I ask them, hey, who's that talking about? 
And if, you know, if you've ever done kind of kids' ministry, you know what the answer is. It doesn't matter what the question is. The answer is always Jesus, right? So they say, Jesus, you know? Like, you know, who, who made the world? Jesus. Who's going to fix coronavirus? Jesus. Who's going to win the election? Jesus. What do you have for breakfast? Uh, Jesus and wee um, but, but, you know, the, the other question I ask these kids um, is this passage in Isaiah. Do you reckon that was written before Jesus or was it written after Jesus? You know, was it written before Jesus or after Jesus? And invariably, they always say, because it's so clearly talking about Jesus, no, it has to be written after Jesus. It's talking about his death, it's talking about the Easter message, that kind of thing. But no, it's written before Jesus, prophesying, predicting the man that would come, the innocent man from God who was punished for our sins. The whole Bible, the Old Testament, it's all pointing towards Jesus. Adam, the first man in the Bible, he points towards Jesus. King David, who defeated Goliath, wrote a bunch of Psalms. He points towards Jesus. You know, even the kind of boring bits of the Bible, you know those boring bits of the Bible, can't really say that, um, cut the live stream now. You know those boring bits of the Bible, those, um, you know, those genealogies, those names that you can't pronounce, like and, um, you know, and all those, um, there's some Hebrew for you, uh, and all those you know, numbers and, and, and those rules about blood and those rules about how you can't cook a, a goat in its mother's milk. I mean, you know, there goes your Anzac Day plans, I'm sure. Um, you know, what, what, all the, what's all this about? All these things, they actually point towards Jesus. Um, as Zach mentioned, we're going to be kicking off a series uh, looking at Ezra and Nehemiah for a few months. Uh, let's see, how does that point towards Jesus? You know, anytime you read any part of the Old Testament, ask yourself, how does this point towards Jesus? Sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes you need to do a bit of work. Uh, but I guarantee you it is there. So let's look at the next part of the gospel, that Jesus was raised on the third day. This is crucial. Jesus didn't stay dead. If he did, then all that would have achieved is a nice martyr, an example to look towards, which is nice. But it's not exactly good news. It's not life-changing news. Jesus didn't stay dead in the tomb. He's alive. He overcame death so that we too can overcome death. If we trust in Jesus, death is not the end of us. How good's that? You know, we don't like talking about death much as Aussies. Um, just yesterday, I was at my grandpa's um, 93rd birthday. He's got stage four cancer. He, probably his last birthday, and yet our family doesn't really want to acknowledge that, use that kind of word. We sort of like to use the word, you know, passed away or gone to a better place. But, you know, there's, there's two certainties of life. What are they? Death and taxes. Jesus came to abolish tax. No, he didn't actually. Um, but no, Jesus came to overcome death. Death. Death is not the end. Do you notice, though, in verse, back in verse 2, um, Jesus says that, sorry, Paul says that this is the gospel by which you're being saved. If you hold fast to the word by which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. This is the only gospel. This is the only good news that will save you. And what do you have to do? You actually have to hold fast to it. You have to grab hold to it of it. Now, I'm not sure uh, when your birthday is. Uh, one's coming up in July. But... Um, you know, imagine your birthday, right? Imagine you get a brand new iPhone, like 13 or 15 or 26 or whatever number they are up to. Uh, you get this you get this iPhone, right? You know, it's not enough to kind of go, yeah, I believe that I've received it. Um, you know, you might even see the iPhone and you might go, yeah, like that's cool. I'm going to kind of read the instruction manual and memorize it. I'm going to get a, an Apple tattoo kind of on my arm. I'm going to kind of hang out in the Apple store each week with a bunch of friends. I'm going to kind of sing songs about Steve Jobs and it's going to be amazing. Um, it's not enough just to do this thing to call yourself an iPhone user. You actually have to grab hold of the thing and actually use it. You know, if someone gives you a present like an iPhone 13, it's futile if you do all of these things and don't actually pick it up and use the damn thing. But the gospel, see, it doesn't matter, um, doesn't matter if we kind of believe all these truths in our head, if we um, hang out with other Christians, if we come to church each week, if we, um, you know, if we sing songs about Jesus, if we memorize parts of the Bible, but we don't actually accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, if we don't actually receive it into our heart, we're believed in vain. 
You're a fake Christian, Paul says. Some of us, some of you are in danger of believing in vain. You know, maybe you come from a Christian family and all you've known is church, and yet you haven't actually understood and accepted the message of Jesus. You've been maybe trying to pay God back for stuff you've done. God says, no, no, it's free. You need to receive it. You need to say thank you to Jesus for what he's done for you. You know, prayer, bits of the Bible memorized, like these things don't save you. Going to church to kind of pay for whatever you did last night, that, that doesn't, that's not how it works. Only Jesus can pay for your sin. This is the essence of the gospel, that Christ died. Uh, he was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. All of this according to the scriptures. This is the essence of the gospel. First point, that's my longest point. I'll move on a little quicker. Let's look at the evidence for the gospel. Paul gives a bunch of historical evidence to, to back up his claim because this is important. If Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead physically, there is no good news. And so he shows the Corinthian church and indeed us evidence. Check out verse 5. And then he appeared to Cephas. After he rose, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. See, Paul, he's not just writing on blind faith. The resurrected Jesus appeared to Peter, who, who's still alive at this point. He wrote the letters of 1 and 2 Peter. We looked at 1 Peter you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, Peter, history tells us he actually died. He was crucified upside down for believing in the message of Jesus. He was a real guy. Not just Peter, the, the 12, that's the, the 12 apostles, the, the closest followers of Jesus that we can read about in the book of Acts. Real men. But there's even more evidence. He keeps going. 12 is not enough. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers, literally brothers and sisters um, at one time, many of whom, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Love that. Some have fallen asleep because of the message of, of Jesus defeating death. They've died. And yet we can say that they've fallen asleep because they haven't really died. They're, they're with the Lord. But there's over 500 people. Most of them are still alive. As Paul writes, you could ask them, you could challenge them, you could see if the story stacks up. If the five, 500 wasn't enough, um, fascinating what Paul says in verse 7, then he appeared to James. Now, why is that even more impressive? Well, this is Jesus' brother. It's the guy who grew up with Jesus. Imagine having Jesus as your, as your brother. <laughs> My brother's a lawyer and, you know, we get compared to, that's hard enough to kind of be compared to him. But, you know, Jesus having an older brother, you know, James is probably, you know, doing kind of tradey work with him as a carpenter growing up. Um, in Mark 3, we can actually read about how Jesus' family were pretty skeptical of Jesus' ministry. They tried to kind of grab him and take him away after he was doing things like claiming to be able to forgive sins and heal people. He said, come on, Jesus, come with us, come with us. What are you doing, mate? The sceptical James, the sceptical younger brother James, uh, the cynical James, he became so convinced of who Jesus was. He saw him and the resurrected Jesus. He, he ended up writing the letter of, of James. He ended up um, becoming a pastor. And he includes, um, and, and he's another man that gives evidence there um, for Jesus' testimony. Now, finally, Paul includes his own story in verse 8. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. See, Paul includes his own experience there. Paul, uh, we can read about this in, in Acts 9, uh, on the road to Damascus, he met the resurrected Jesus. He saw a light and Jesus spoke to him through that. Paul, Paul, why are you, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was blinded for a few days, but he met the resurrected Jesus. Now, Paul, he says that this is you know, untimely. This is kind of a weird thing. You know, I don't know all your stories, but if you're a follower of Jesus, like, I don't think most of us kind of meet Jesus kind of on the road to you know, the Gold Coast or whatever. <laughs> like, this is kind of weird, right? Paul recognises it's weird. Um, but as an aside, like, he does include his own experience, um, and there's something to that. Uh, you know, in our kind of post-modern -post culture, we value experience. We value personal testimony. If you share your story, um, one thing people can't say is it's wrong because it's your story. There's something to that. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a story to tell. You have a story to tell. But look at, look at Paul's story. Look at what he says his life was like before. He says in verse 9, I am the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy 
to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. See, prior to meeting Jesus, Paul was a persecutor. He was a religious zealot. Like you could almost say he was a terrorist. Kind of in God's name, he was killing Christians and getting them commissioned to be killed. Yet his life was transformed when he met Jesus. From persecutor to preacher to then prisoner being persecuted himself. You know, if you want kind of more evidence for some of this stuff, um, come along on Tuesday night just down the road to the Bavarian and we'll be talking a bit about that stuff. Love to chat to you about the evidence of the gospel. So we've seen the essence of the gospel. We've seen the evidence for the gospel. And finally, let's look at the effects of the gospel, the effect of the gospel. So the gospel is not something that only saves us from death, but it also transforms our life. Check out verse 8. 10. Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not without effect. Was not, sorry, was not in vain. Paul can move from being a persecutor to a preacher because of the grace of God. See, grace it just means gift. It's not anything that Paul has done to earn it. It's free. You know, I know, I know a bunch of you guys um, sponsor children through compassion. Sit down a hill, Brisbane. I think it's 105, 110 kids that we, we personally sponsor, and I know some of you sponsor through other organisations as well. Now, when you do that, right? When you kind of um, do a gift like that, you don't kind of go, "Hey, I want to make sure this goes to the nicest kid in the village." You don't kind of have this criteria that they need to meet in order for you to give. No, you just give freely, right? You give out of the generosity, out of the kindness of your heart. In the same way, the gospel, the good news from Jesus, it's a gift. We can't do anything to earn it. It's only by God's kindness. But this grace, it's not just this one-off payment. You know, Christianity, it's not a life insurance policy that you kind of tuck in your top pocket and, and save it. It's not just pie in the sky when you die. Steak on the plate while you wait. There's meat to it now. You get to enjoy the blessing of Jesus now. The gospel, it means good news. Good news that changes us now. And so if we are a follower of Jesus, it means we have God's Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus with us, transforming our lives. Paul's life was transformed to become more like Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, it means that you too, your life is being transformed by God's Spirit. Now, the Christian life, it's not like a, an escalator that's kind of moving in a linear direction and each day you become 1% more spiritually mature than the day before and kind of, you know, it's not like that. Now, it's more like a roller coaster that kind of goes up and down and there's twists and turns and there's different seasons, yeah? There's different seasons where sometimes we might feel pretty distant from God. Uh, we might feel doubting or despairing. Whereas other times uh, we're experiencing joy and, and growth and, and we just sense that God is really with us and we're encouraged. Uh, and sometimes that can quickly change from one to another. But can I encourage you that God is with you despite the ups and downs of life. And notice the language in verse 2. This is the gospel by which you are being saved. There's actually a a past, a present, and a future effect of God's grace. Jesus died in the past for our sins. In the future, we will raise, we will be with God. But right now, we are being saved. Now, before I put my trust in Jesus, I had a, a massive problem with, with lust, with laziness, with liquor, with alcohol. Uh, I was racist, like all kinds of stuff that I struggled with. Now, when I became a Christian... Did all those things just go away like that? No, they didn't. I was a work, I still am a work in progress. Do I make dumb decisions? Absolutely. Anyone who knows me for any time can testify to that. Chat to my wife um, if you want to you know, hear some dumb decisions I've made. But, you know, but is God at work in my life? Yes, God is changing me. Each year, I get to enjoy God more. I get to live with him and God changes me. By his grace, he saves me from making many dumb decisions. If you're a Christian, God will keep transforming you to make you more and more like Christ. We're all still works in progress, but how does God work 
in us. Check out verse 10. Uh, Paul says he, he works harder than all, the, uh, all, the, all of them. That's the other apostles. Yet, not I, but the grace of God that was with me. God's grace, God's presence, God's power works within us so that we work for God. God doesn't just kind of save us into this kind of neutral state so that we can just sit back and relax and have an umbrella straw and, and drink cocktails by the beach. No, God saves us right here right now so that we can work for him. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says that Paul says we're saved by grace. It's a gift. It's not by works. No one can boast. But we're, we're God's handiwork created to do good works. We're made to work for him. And God's grace works within us. Once we understand what the gospel is, the good news, we're called to hold on to it and join God in his work. Now, maybe the last couple of years, um, COVID-19, it's caused you to kind of recluse a little bit. Uh, there's been lots of reasons, lots of good reasons to isolate, but maybe you've kind of isolated a bit more of yourself. You've retreated a little bit more. You've just been a bit more comfortable You've just enjoyed kind of the comforts of your home a little bit too much. Uh, maybe you've you know, enjoyed the, the kind of COVID comfort food, getting a bit flabby. Let's not be spiritually flabby. Let me urge you, work hard for God because he is returning through Jesus. God is with you and he wants to work with you. Jesus has defeated death on the cross. He's alive and that's your reality. This is good news. Let me ask you this. Do you believe it? Do you really believe that this is the best news ever? Maybe you've got questions. would love to explore those with you. Maybe you've got real doubts, even if you've been um, walking in Christian circles for a long time. Friends, I've had a real season of doubt before, and that was even when I was kind of in ministry. This, this stuff's real. We need to be talking about it honestly as a community. Come along this Tuesday night, Introducing Jesus, a great space to ask questions, to sit back, to hear others' questions, and engage with the claims of Jesus. You can pray. You can ask God to reveal himself to you. Um, and, but reading his word, he speaks to you. How's your relationship with God going? How are you going thanking God for what he's done in your life? Are you living in relationship with Jesus, or do you just know stuff about Jesus? Are you allowing God to change you, to change you by his gospel? When was the last time you shared this news with someone? You know, maybe someone, even at church, uh, do you naturally talk about the things of Jesus? Uh, maybe someone in your family or at work. Friends, the gospel, it's of first importance. Jesus passed it on to Paul and the other apostles who then passed it on to Jesus' church. And if you're a Christian today, it's only because that someone's passed on the message to you. Friends, we're recipients of this gospel. How are you going at passing it on to others? Maybe to younger people. Maybe to kids and youth at church. Uh, maybe to your family, your colleagues, your classmates. Now, I ask these questions, you know, not to kind of beat us up and you know, think, oh, guilt trip us to do, do all this evangelism. We're not saved by kind of our work. We're not saved by the, the amount of God conversations we have. No. And I know that some of us here, we're quite self-critical. We're quite introspective. Um, and and we, we kind of feel beat up. Friends, you're saved by grace. Uh, nothing you can do uh, will make you more right with God. And nothing that you fail to do will, will fall you out of God's favour. Friends, you're free. You're saved by God. But friends, this is also good news. And let's not cling on to this good news. Let's share it with the world that needs it. Friends, also as a family, uh, we have an opportunity uh, to be encouraging each other. You know that Christian life, it's like a roller coaster. Sometimes um, we, it's hard to identify our own spiritual growth. But friends, we've got each other. Are you in community with each other? And when you are, when you notice something, do you say something? Do we point out specific moments of grace in people's life, of, of things that we're encouraged by, maybe things that they've served in, maybe things they've shared, maybe um, how they've dealt to a tricky situation at work, maybe boldness they've had to share the good news of Jesus, maybe um, whatever it is, maybe being able to fight sin. How often are you sharing, uh, encouraging, uh, noticing what you, you see and encouraging others um, that are in your life? 
Friends, we need each other. Life's hard. Who knows what the next few months, years will look like? There's going to be lots of twists and turns, as we've seen over the last few years. It's unpredictable. But what do we know? Certainty that Jesus has overcome death. This is good news. Let's keep going and living hard in light of God's grace. It's not about trying hard. It's about living with Jesus, being changed by his word in community with each other. Paul wants to remind the church, the Corinthian church and us that this is of first importance. This is good news. It's the best news ever. Better than a new baby into the family. We've become part of God's family. We've been invited to glory with him. There's nothing more important. There's no greater news. How about I pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have shown us the good news, the gospel, that Jesus died according to the scriptures for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised up on the third day. And yet, Lord, for those of us who are doubting, those of us who are perhaps not trusting in you, help us to see that you are a God worth trusting because you defeated death. May we believe that in our hearts, not just in our head. And may it change our lives as it should. And may we be willing to share with others the good news as Paul and the apostles have done. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
song um, for this morning. Uh, so let's finish together by joining um, and singing that our God is for us. to the screen we have the trailer for our new series. As a uh, drummer, that's my favourite trailer so far, so it's pretty cool. Hey, um, it's exciting. Next Sunday, we are kicking off our Ezra and Nehemiah series called Rebuild. Uh, it's going to be a good time together in God's Word. Ezra and Nehemiah is a story of the faithfulness of God, of the spiritual renewal of his people under his care and call. It is a story of salvation uh, and restored purpose and hope. Uh, it's going to be a great time together as we look at these two uh, books, as we look at the, the story and the narrative, and as we ultimately see how they point us to the ultimate restoration through Jesus Christ. Uh, so can I encourage you, uh, join us next Sunday, um, and then for quite a few Sundays after that, it's a good long series, a good chance to really 
really dive in and get to know what's going on in these books. Uh, so that is kicking off next Sunday morning. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you were able to come. Um, and remember, if you are new with us, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, we'd love to shout you a coffee. Uh, maybe if you're... Uh, looking for something to do, find out if people are going to Tiger Eye or somewhere else for lunch, or if you're not having any plans, invite a bunch of people to your house, whatever it might be. Um, community continues, firstly in the foyer, but then let's make ways for that to happen afterwards as well. Um, as I said, let's join next Sunday to jump into our Rebuild series, but until then, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.